welcome here, everybody. I'm so glad you could join us this morning. Let's review a few things. Who made the world? God made the world. And when he did, what did he say about it? He said it was good. And he said that people were very good. He made people in his what? God made people in his image. What does that mean? Being made in God's image means we represent him on earth, that we're meant to rule with him, to take care of the earth, and that we reflect him and who he is. The idea of ruling the earth and subduing it is probably kind of confusing and words you've never used before. God called people to multiply and fill the earth and work the garden. I'll give you an example that's really in everybody's minds right now. An example of ruling the earth by working in grocery stores and driving trucks and definitely by farming. We've got people in our community who are feeding way more people than could feed themselves. That's a way we rule and subdue the earth and make it better and better. That's a great example of fulfilling the mission God originally gave to Adam and Eve. Last week, one of the ways we talked about that we all reflect God is that he's relational. How is God at his core a God of relationships. God is Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, loving each other in relationship. And he created us to love and be loved. He created Adam and Eve to be loved by him and to love him. Let's read about how he loved them in Genesis 2. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat of any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if you eat from it, you will certainly die. Let's watch this video to see what happens next in Genesis chapter three. Stories of the Bible. Adam and Eve sin. This is Adam. Hey. And this is Eve. Hey. Who were the first people on earth. They lived in the Garden of Eden, which was a beautiful place that had everything they needed. Adam and Eve took care of the animals and could eat from any of the trees in the garden, except for one. This was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and God told them not to eat from this tree. There were lots of animals in the garden, but the serpent was the most clever of all the wild animals God had made. Hmm. One day, he asked the woman, Hey, Eve. Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of these trees in the garden? Eve said that they were able to eat from all of the fruit trees except the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. For God said, you must not eat or even touch it. If you do, you will die. No, that can't be. You won't die, said the serpent. God knows that as soon as you eat it, you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. <gasps> oh. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to Adam and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened. Oh no! And they suddenly realized they weren't wearing clothes and were embarrassed. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. 
When the cool evening breezes were blowing, Adam and Eve heard God walking about in the garden. Hi! So they hid from God among the trees. Then God called to Adam, Where are you? Adam said, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? God asked. Did you eat from the tree I told you not to eat from? Adam said, It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Then God asked Eve, What have you done? The serpent tricked me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Then God punished the serpent by making it so he would crawl on his belly from then on. He told Eve that she would have great pain in her life. Then God said to Adam that because he listened to Eve and did not obey what God had told him to do, his life would be very difficult. He would have to work hard to get food to eat, God said, for you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Then God made them clothing from the animals. But God knew that Adam and Eve could no longer live in the garden because of their sin. So he sent them away and closed up the garden. Does that make you feel sad? It makes me feel sad. Do you think God stopped loving Adam and Eve? Is that why he had to make them leave the garden? No, of course not. Adam and Eve lost their trust in God. They believed the lies the snake told about God, that God was holding something good back from them, that if they took the fruit, they'd be like God. But that was a lie. It didn't make them more like God. It made them less human. They decided for themselves what was right in their own eyes. They saw the fruit, and it looked good, and they took it. They chose what was good and what was bad for themselves instead of trusting God's definition of good and bad. We, I, do this all the time. We do what we think is going to be good for us. We do what we think will make us happy or will work best for us or keep us safe, even when it's not what our parents or God have told us to do. Take a minute now for each person in your family to share a time you've done this. Parents, you might need to go first. I'll give you an example of my own. Sometimes, even though I know I can't lie, when I tell maybe my husband or my kids something, I like to tell it to them in a way that they won't be mad at me or in a way that will be happy in a way that will make it better and easier for me, instead of trusting them and trusting God by telling the whole truth. When we choose what is good for ourselves, or when we see something good and take it, instead of letting God give it to us, things don't go well for us. Pieces of our lives, or who we are, or how we image and reflect God, they get broken and they die. From my example, when I'm not truthful with my family, then part of our relationship gets broken. They get hurt that I don't trust them or, or that they can't trust me in the future to tell the truth. We were made to reflect God's image, reflect who he is, and we do. But when we don't trust him, something in us, in our image, breaks And then his image in us is distorted. Things in our lives get broken and don't work the way they should. Our relationships get broken and don't work the way they should. Pieces of our lives and our world start to die. That's the story that Genesis chapter 3 to 11 tell us. The first book in the Bible is a book you've probably heard of. It's called Genesis. The book is designed to fall into two main parts. You have uh, chapters 1 through 11, which is telling the story of God and the whole world. And then you have the second part, which is about God and Abraham's family, as chapters 12 through 50. And how the two of those parts relate, that's where you find the message of the book. 
Okay, so let's start back at the beginning. The first part of Genesis begins with a creation story where God creates everything. And how exactly that happens, of course, that's where all the debates come. But he takes a dark, watery chaos and he turns it into a beautiful garden where humans can can flourish. That sounds nice. It does sound nice. In fact, seven different times God says of all that he's made that it's good. And this is where we meet the first human characters in the Bible, Adam and Eve. And God creates them in his image. In other words, humanity reflects or is meant to reflect the, the, the creativity, the goodness and character of the creator out into the world that he's made. And they're supposed to reproduce and make cultures and neighborhoods and art and gardens and, and everything else. But he gives them a, a moral choice about how they're going to go about building this world. And this is what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is all about. And he tells them, don't eat of the fruit of this tree or you will die. What's that all about? So up till now, God has been the one defining and providing what is good. And so God is the one with the knowledge of good and evil. But now this tree represents a choice. Will the humans trust God's definition of good and evil? Or are they going to seize the opportunity and define good and evil for themselves. And Adam and Eve eat the fruit. This is the core biblical explanation for that concept of sin, that desire to call the shots myself. It's the inward turn of the human heart to do what's good for me and my tribe, even if it's at the expense of you and, and your tribe. And the problem is humans are horrible at defining good and evil without God. And so now that humanity's made this choice, Things get really, really, they really bad. So Genesis 3 through 11 is like tracing this downward spiral of all, all humanity. When Adam and Eve left the garden, God still took care of them. He sacrificed an animal's life to make clothes to cover over Adam and Eve. He made them leave the garden so that, verse 22, the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Why do you think God didn't want to allow the humans to live forever? God didn't want them to live forever, hiding from him, not trusting him, God wants them to live forever in relationship with him. And he had a plan. When God tells the snake and even Adam what bad things are going to happen now because they had chosen to do what they thought was good, he also says this, verse 15. I will make you, the snake, and the woman hate each other. Your children and her children will be enemies and her son will crush your head, and you will bite his heel. God tells them that people and the dark power of the lying snake will continue to fight each other, just like you and I today are fighting against the lie that God can't be trusted, or fighting against the desire to just take something good when we see it, or fighting against the desire to decide for myself what I think is good. But but God promises right here in the first pages of the big story that eventually Eve will have a son and that son will crush the snake. But the snake would bite his heel. There's this crazy story at the beginning of the Bible. We have Adam and Eve and they're in the Garden of Eden. And everything in this garden is great. It's exactly as it should be, except... There's this one tree that they're told by God not to eat from because it's dangerous and it will kill them. So that's it. Uh, avoid this fruit tree and we're fine. Right. It seems pretty simple. But in this garden, there's a snake. And it starts telling a different story. It says that if you eat of this tree, it's not going to kill you. In fact, it's going to make you become like God. And Adam and Eve, they believe the snake and they eat the fruit. And because of this, the goodness of the garden is tragically lost and evil and death enters into God's good world. Now, why is there a talking snake in the garden? I mean, 
this thing is a problem. Yeah, it's very strange. And even more strange is the fact that the Bible doesn't say why or how this thing even got there. It just presents the snake as this creature who's in rebellion against God and that wants to get other people to doubt God's goodness and lead them on a path towards death. And so whatever this snake is, it's the source of evil that pervades our world and our lives, even still today. But there is some hope because right here in the story, God makes this really interesting promise to Adam and Eve. That someone is going to come in the future, a son of Eve. And this guy's going to come and he's going to crush the serpent's head and destroy evil at its source. However, during this battle, the serpent is going to bite this guy's heel. So it's like a mutual destruction. Yeah, it's this very strange but beautiful promise. And it's just left hanging there until the next key moment in the story. In the beginning, God made a very good world, and he made us in his image. But we didn't trust him. We listened to the lies that we should do it our own way, the lies of the snake, the evil and the selfishness in each of us. But God made a promise. He made a promise that one day the snake crusher would come the one who is going to destroy the snake forever. Even though the snake would bite his heel, Jesus would come back to life, showing that the power of the snake, of evil and sin in us had been destroyed. Just like we've been talking about in the Book of Mark unit before this. And one day, Jesus will resurrect the whole world and it will be very good. And all the power of sin and death and evil will be gone forever. Dear God, thank you that when we did not trust you in our own lives and as humanity, thank you that when we don't trust you, you still take care of us you still love us and thank you that you promised right from the beginning you had a plan so that we could be in a trusting relationship with you forever please help us to trust you today and this week we love you jesus amen